Uh, Gordon, what do you think it is? I think it's uh, a 5100 successor with a new sensor, but I hope there's more to it than that. Pupil detection and nose hair detection. We need lenses. Well, I really wish there'd be an A7S III. I think the last four or five events that I went to, that's what I was hoping for. Action cam, obviously. For sure. Animal IAF. I'm just hoping they're going to make the buttons even smaller and the menu system more complex. Welcome back, Deep Review TV viewers. Chris Nichols here from Deep Review, and we're coming to you from sunny San Diego, I guess. It's one of the rare moments where you get some rain here in San Diego, but that's okay. It's a beautiful place, and we're out here because this is where Sony's headquarters are here in the coast. And uh, that's because we've been invited to Sony's launch event for the Alpha 6400, their brand new APS-C mid-range camera. So again, full disclosure, flew us out here, hotel rooms, we really appreciate it. But as always, we are gonna be giving you an honest review of this now full production camera that's on the market. All right, now, although this is an A6400 review, I do want to mention that Jordan's shooting this whole video on an Alpha A9, and he's using it with their new Prototype Beta Firmware 5.0. This brings a lot of interesting updates, but one of the things that's really appealing is now a touch-based tracking system. It replaces the lock-on autofocus, and it promises to do a pretty good job in video. So throughout this whole thing, Jordan is going to be using the tracking autofocus. I have no idea if it's doing a good job or not, but if it doesn't, Give it a little bit of a leeway because this is, again, beta. Now, in the A6400, the handling and the body design is actually very similar to the 6300, although I do find the grip is a little bit larger, more akin to the A6500. Now, keep in mind that we are still using the same W batteries because of that. And with the testing we've kind of done here, the SEPA ratings, we're not really getting any improvement in battery efficiency. So, you know, the W batteries, they really don't last that long, but at this point, if you are an existing Sony user, you probably already have 10 of these at home. Single card slot as well. Now, the other big interface change is going to be the fully articulating screen. Now, I'm saying fully in a vertical format. We can shoot down, we can shoot waist level, and we can also get a selfie type screen. It's interesting that it articulates like that, but the EVF does block a slight amount of it, and more importantly, if you are gonna put on a light or a shotgun microphone to vlog with, that is gonna to totally obscure your view. On the plus side, it is a fully integrated touchscreen, and when you put it up into this mode, it actually automatically engages a selfie-style countdown for uh, all those nice shots of you and your friends. Now the 6400, just like the 6300, is weather sealed. Although again, Sony's weather sealing, I mean again, I've got no problem putting the camera in the water like this, <laughs> or myself. But uh, your main concern is going to be that bottom plate. You still don't want to get these too immersed and you want to keep it off the bottom of the camera. But otherwise, it should handle that no problem. Okay, so we've got a brand new camera with the A6400, but we're still using the same sensor as the A6300. It's not a bad sensor, good resolution, of course, APS-C. However, rolling shutter is now, at this point in time, gonna be fairly low down the pack. Oh, there's many cameras that have much better characteristics for this. So in photography, if you are gonna be shooting silent, just keep that in mind. You are gonna get a little bit of rolling shutter. And of course, this is gonna play a part in video applications as well. So when we first played with the Sony a6300, we were not exactly blown away by its buffer capacity and that slow SD card slot, UHS-1 speed. It took a lot of time to clear the cards as well. It slowed down your whole process. The 6500 improved that because it had a much better buffer. And I'm happy to say that the a6400 has a very similar buffer capacity. And that's good. I mean, how is this gonna impact your shooting? If you shoot wildlife and sports, you'll find that you can shoot longer at these faster 11 frame per second shooting speeds before the camera slows down. But we are still stuck with that slower SD card slot. I don't know why they haven't upgraded that, but it does slow down your whole process. Still, if you are shooting sports in action, you are gonna have more time before the camera completely chugs. Oh, 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 oh.
Hey, Jordan, eyes over here. Come on, jeez, professionalism. So I just wanted to take a quick moment to talk about one of the nice new features here. We still have lengthy menus, but the customizability of the buttons has uh, really opened up a lot of possibilities here. And I also like the graphic interface. It makes it way easier uh, to see which buttons you're setting. It's something we take for granted with a lot of other brands, but finally Sony's improving their menu here too. Hey everyone, it's Jordan, the video guy, to talk about the 6400 for video. And I use the a6300 a lot as a B cam. Now the 6400 has a lot of the same advantages of that camera and still hangs on to some of its disadvantage. The biggest new feature is we now get the tracking AF in video where you can just touch your subject and they'll follow it, just like on a Canon or Nikon camera. And it does do an excellent job as long as the proper subject is highlighted. So you touch that subject, if the box stays on it, like you can see here, it does a great job. It's not the stickiest, however, so occasionally it'll just drift off your subject onto something else. Now they've also added the HLG profile, so you can get HDR straight out of camera into a TV, but I have difficulty with a lot of the Sony HLG profiles. They just don't grade that well because it's still an 8-bit recording. Now the Sony a6300 and 6500 gave you the option to do time lapses through their Play Memories app. They've gotten rid of that, now we have a built-in time lapse mode which works really nicely. Only drawback to it that I can see is it won't build the video file for you, so you'll still have to do it in software like Sony's Edge software after the fact. It is a bit of a drawback, but not a huge deal breaker. Big drawbacks to the A6300 for me were the extreme rolling shutter, and unfortunately, I think we've got the same sensor here. There is still a ton of wobble in the footage that you're getting out of this. As you can see here, it can be quite distracting, and the lack of IBIS means that you're really gonna see that wobble when you're hand-holding as well. Chris is hand-holding now, but unless it's a perfectly stable shot like this, you will see some weirdness. However, the big drawback for us was the overheating of the A6300, and it looks like that has been addressed. Not only was I able to record more than an hour uninterrupted in 4K, but there doesn't seem to be any record limit on this camera at all. We were able to record multiple 40-minute clips, so if you're looking for something that's like a long-term talk-to-camera solution, or where you can just tap a subject, have it keep tracking, it'll do that, and it'll do a wonderful job. Everyone's talking about the A6400 as a vlogging camera. Sony gave it to a lot of vloggers to test. And honestly, I don't think this is a good vlogging camera. It should be on a tripod, it should be on a gimbal, because when you flip that screen up and you've got a mic attached, you can't see what you're filming, but also no headphone jack, no IBIS, and because of that extreme rolling shutter, it's not a great camera handheld. I think this is a killer B camera, but as far as vlogging cameras go, there's much better options out there. All right, welcome back. So first off, we had to give the A9 back, so we're back to our trusty GH5, but now I wanna talk about autofocus, which is really the big star of this episode. This is the technology that we're most excited about, and it's not only on the A6400, but also the A9, and even being upgraded to some degree on some of the other cameras in the lineup. I think the best way to look at this is that Sony has really upgraded their entire autofocusing system in a very comprehensive way. Things like color detection, which they used before, have been upgraded to really evaluate brightness in a more effective way. We have things like distance being upgraded and how they determine distances. They don't skip from a close distance to a far distance like they used to. They're now far tighter. Uh, things like face detect have been improved and things like eye detection have also been improved to the point where we're now also gonna have very shortly in the summertime, animal eyes being detected detected properly, but now also pattern recognition. So the ability to recognize an object and lock onto it. And that is why we now have replaced lock on autofocus with what they call real time tracking. So as a photographer and as a photography teacher, the challenges that I've often seen and the ones that I'm sure you also struggle with regularly are just getting a good hit rate, getting photos sharply in focus, and autofocus is such a big part of that. You know, challenges like what's the right focusing mode? Where do I place my focusing point? AFC, AFS, you know, what mode suits what situation? And what would really make things easier is a system where I don't have to make all these decisions and I can let the camera do some of those choices. I'm gonna talk about a few systems that I really like from the past. So Nikon 3D tracking was one of my favorite systems. I put a single point on my subject, it remembers it, and we really, really enjoyed that. Sony then brought a lot to the table when they introduced eye autofocus. That's why it made such a stir. Unfortunately, Sony's lock on autofocus was often ineffective. So the way I like to think of it now is we have this new Sony system, which takes a lot of what makes 3D tracking for Nikon work so well, that object pattern recognition, and now all the benefits of seamless face and eye 
eye detection. The other big benefit here is that when I set up the camera appropriately with real-time tracking, eye detect, and face detect turned on, the camera can basically just transition smoothly and seamlessly from a person's eye, if they can't get the eye, then to their face, if they turn away, then to lock on tracking them as an object, recognizing that pattern. But my biggest takeaway in this whole experience has actually really been trusting the real-time tracking, letting the face detect an eye autofocus transition seamlessly, and I was not disappointed. This system worked really well and it gave me my highest success rates to date. This is by no means a miraculous system. I mean, of course, it's not perfect, but this is what it really comes down to. We've always had great effective autofocusing capabilities, but we've often had to set the right setting, customize the right way, and switch it rapidly for the right situation. And what this really does is simplify the whole process. The camera does a lot of that in a very intelligent way. So now I can go from shooting landscape, to shooting a portrait, to shooting kids running around, to pets, to wildlife, to journalism, and I might find that the camera can help me with a lot of that workload so that I don't have to customize it for each and every scenario as it changes. It's going to simplify things and make the autofocusing easier and more successful. And I think the really exciting thing to keep in mind is not only Sony, but perhaps other manufacturers will take this further and we're going to see improvements across the board. Okay, so here's my final thoughts on the A6400. You know, out on the net, there's a lot of moaning and groaning and, and really a lot of negative attitudes towards this camera. And you know what? I actually agree with a lot of them. I mean, is this really just an A6300 with a tilt screen and a slightly wider grip and a slightly bigger buffer? Yeah, absolutely, it really is. And in that regard, it hasn't really innovated much at all. I think what we really have to appreciate is actually the firmware and this new autofocusing system. I look at this camera as a test bed for that technology, and that is by far the most exciting thing. And really, when it comes to photography now, we have good image quality. We have a lot of these challenges covered and what people still struggle with is getting a good hit rate, getting photos so that when they get home, load them on the computer, they're sharp and usable. So we have affordable camera that has an immensely high hit rate, is easy to use, and that's why I think this is an awesome family camera or beginner's camera. The price point is acceptable and you are getting the best autofocusing I've seen on an APS-C camera. So if you have an A6300 or 6500, do you need to rush out and upgrade for this tech? No, definitely not. I mean, we're getting the same image quality. It's still the same battery life and the W batteries. There's no need. But if you are looking for your first APS-C camera, there's some awesome tech in here. If you're a video maker and you want a good B camera without record limit, this is also an affordable choice. Should I go to the 6500 to get the IBIS? I think in my opinion you should wait because what's really going to be exciting is watching this autofocus going through into the future. So I want to see what the 6500 replacement is going to be. That could be a very powerful camera indeed. Anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this review. Don't forget Instagram, Twitter, subscribe to the channel, check us out on deepreview.com, check out the sample galleries and the reviews and articles to come as well. That'll all be a great resource for you. Otherwise, we will see you very soon.